Craig, where are you? Fantastic presentation. And uh, you are my nightmare coming true, having to present after you. You present a sexy car on the beach in California. I'm going to present a brown granulate. <laughs> but um, I hope that during the next 15, 20 minutes, I can manage, probably not to make this sexy. Oh, I need the geo, wait. But maybe I can share my enthusiasm and um, our business case, its opportunities, but also its challenges with you. That is a key aspect, oh right, a key aspect of my presentation. First of all, I would like to, being you know, just shortly after lunch, I would like to keep it entertaining more than educating. If you want to learn more about GeoHumus and about uh, hard facts, about numbers, our turnover, um, our target markets, where we are, what we do, uh, I think we can talk later on. I'd like to keep this as bullet point free as possible. So uh, let's see how we're doing. Before I start, it's relatively well timed, I hope. I'm going to pour various granulates or soil enhancers into these uh, three water containers or uh, vases. The one in the middle, you will have guessed, is GeoHumus. That is our product. Before I start, um, I can't resist, Craig, uh, presenting after you, I can't resist uh, the temptation to say one thing about California and about uh, you know, being on stage. And um, I'm going to tell you a true story. I haven't made this up. I spent um, almost the last four weeks in hospital. Um, you don't know me, so you have nothing to compare against, but I lost around about six kilos. I'm uh, well on the way to recovery. Um, I'm now making my first public appearance in months. I'm appearing with a dark turtleneck on stage, and I'm presenting our product. Who are you thinking of? Steve Jobs, exactly. Steve Jobs has something in common with a Tesla car. He's presenting a sexy product, something we all want, a smartphone. I mean, I think that's the one they are most uh, recognized for, rightly so. Funny enough, the value of our company is not linked to my health at all. And this is the first of a series of references I'm going to make um, to Apple. And uh, I hope, I mean, share your thoughts with me afterwards, um, that actually we can find a few parallels. So enough said before we actually start with talking about GeoHumus, a soil enhancer that we believe is going to revolutionize the way agriculture works. It's probably time for the first bullet point free slide. <laughs> Technical problems. There we go. The world is changing at a breathtaking pace. You know, I could stand here and I could say, um, we want to change the world. GeoHumus wants to change the world. The news is, I'm not sure it's good news, the world is changing all by itself, quickly. We all witness the change. We see um, discussions about energy. You know, how can we move away from uh, carbon-based uh, uh, energy generation to uh, renewable energy? That's uh, one of the main topics here. I'm going to take you into agriculture. You think, why? Well, agriculture, how is that linked to green venture? It's linked to green venture, obviously, because it has to do with plants. But let's talk about, before I actually do this, let's talk about we have. We have land degradation. That's you know, one thing that uh, agricultural land is actually the use of agricultural land um, has been done so excessively 
that uh, the use uh, or the usability of the land in some uh, places is going down. Uh, the the soil um, is um, you know has a distinct lack of uh, nutrients in some cases. Um, that uh, actually desertification is progressing. Uh, all those uh, classic climate change induced, but also mankind induced through the use of land change of agriculture. We have another um, change which is uh, also found in the media uh, everywhere. It's uh, polar ice cap uh, melting and uh, polar bears in despair. It's uh, glaciers melting away, it's uh, climate zones shifting, it's the desert taking over. All these topics are large global aspects. So what does this to do with our grey uh, not so sexy, but I think uh, very interesting granulate here. Oh, no, hang on. Sorry. First of all, um, looking at the globe, you would think, I mean, we call it the blue planet. You would think the volume of total amount of water on Earth shouldn't be a problem. And we heard earlier in, in uh, the presentation on algae, which, uh, of course, I liked a lot, that they use salt water to grow algae. And salt water, as a matter of fact, makes up most of nearly all of the water on the planet. The fresh water, Süßwasser, that uh, we can use, or actually, first of all, the fresh water available on the planet, is that smaller drop there. So in proportion, it's a lot less than the total amount of water. And of that fresh water, thinking of polar ice caps or glaciers, again, the majority, vast majority of the water is bound in ice and hence not available for us to use in agriculture. So only a tiny fraction of the total water, fresh water, available for use, uh, is available for use. And uh, there's another striking fact about water, and that's the fact that you can reduce, or, sorry, you can replace carbon produced energy with wind or solar produced energy, you can never replace water. So as we have currently, I'm not exactly sure if that number is correct, but roughly 7 billion, uh, definitely heading for 7 billion uh, people on the planet, and we have a set amount of water. If you compare that to only 50 years ago, it was 3 billion people, same amount of water going around in circles. And the future, 2050 projection, and again, that may be off by a billion or two, we don't know, but the amount of water is not going to increase. So the water you use to feed all of us is going to be the same as today. Taking you um, into the world of virtual water and with that slide, I will close my general introduction to give you a first, um, well, let the sensitivity grow for this water topic. I want to talk about virtual water. And as much as um, we have a carbon footprint that everybody talks about, you go on holiday, use an aeroplane, you have a carbon footprint for that. You drive your car, unless it's a Tesla, well, actually, even a Tesla has a carbon footprint. You have a water footprint as well, and that depends on, and we picked a few examples here that uh, we generally use, to give you an idea how much water is used, required to produce what we consume. Cup of coffee. I'm not going to ask questions, I think we don't have time for that, so solution, 140 liters of water is required for one cup of coffee. Obviously, not to brew the coffee, but to grow the coffee beans, harvest the beans, and then eventually brew the cup. Another example, uh, wheat. In that case, wheat flour, but it doesn't matter. What do you think? A kilogram of wheat. The solution is 1,500 liters of water per kilogram. And 1,500 liters, obviously, a liter is a kilogram, so we have a ratio of 1 to 1,500. It gets worse. And, I mean, so far you could say, yeah, sure, 
that's very interesting, and it's a striking difference between those two numbers, but uh, obviously there seems to be enough water, otherwise we wouldn't eat bread and we wouldn't have wheat in abundance, and wheat wouldn't be so incredibly cheap on the world market. A ton of wheat, didn't check recently, but uh, a few weeks or probably two months ago, it was something of the order of 150 euros per ton of wheat, i.e. 15 cents per kilogram. You need 1,500 liters of water to produce it. Worst of all, and vegetarians, uh, you do the planet good, more than uh, driving electric cars even, maybe. 15,000 liters of water for one kilogram of beef. And I mean, that is, that is a number, if the first two didn't worry you, that uh, definitely worries me. Um, that actually, and this of course is the long food chain, you have to grow wheat, you have to grow uh, corn, feed it to the animal and then slaughter the animal, and there goes your hamburger or whatever you turn it into. So, this is virtual water, i.e. we have a water footprint. And I think it's clear and not a discussion point that um, water is a valuable resource that is underpriced and that will not be available in abundance. There will be a water shortage. Water shortage is starting already. It's going to get worse. Distribution is going to get worse, i.e. where do you have water available? And uh, we see changes like, uh, for example, in India, where uh, currently the solution is to drill a bit deeper. And you can do that for a certain time period. You need a stronger pump, so you buy a new pump. That is good for the Japanese economy, who are mostly delivering these pumps. Um, but at some point, and we don't know when that will be, those pumps will suck air. So we have a classic conundrum here. If we get to sucking air, it's too late, because geohumus, a water retention granulate that I'm going to come on to, cannot produce water. It can use water more efficiently. So going back to uh, roughly uh, where we started and where the invention started, and I'm going to go through that stage uh, rather quickly, so uh, we can concentrate on, on geohumus and the case. This is the uh, original inventor of geohumus who had the first idea of combining a well-known uh, chemical product, superabsorbent, with rock flour. The background to it, just a, a very short uh, history of it, the background was that the superabsorbent, which is this jelly stuff, and you're all welcome to uh, come over later on and uh, feel this, feel that, and feel the ceramis, which is uh, a classic, uh, you know, standard soil granulate. This does not work in combination with soil. It doesn't because it forms a gel. It does not stay in the place where you put it. It comes to the surface. It has no structure in itself that can interlock with the soil. So for geohumus, the original idea of the scientist was to combine the superabsorbent with a structurally stable um, component, lava rock, and over and above, through that lava rock, uh, beyond the structural stability, provide nutrients to the plant. So that was the, like, the quantum leap of the invention. It then took us, after uh, Dr. Peppmüller, here in his lab at Stockhausen, one of the large manufacturers of superabsorbents, when he left the company and retired, it took roughly 2,000 recipe iterations of our science team to turn this initial idea into a granulate that can absorb round about 40 times its own weight in water.